between their papal nuncios and headquarters. Reporting on human rights violations via email when offending government uh, is the ISP poses some obvious challenges. And the consumer's in the middle. Well, what's next for us? Well, let's look at the trajectory of how the internet has evolved over time. I've segmented the internet into uh, three parts. The mid-90s is when consumers really started to use it for the first time. We used the uh, internet through primarily something called Netscape. It was huge back then, and AOL and, and Yahoo were also massive players. We used the internet primarily for email and surfing the web, which was pretty much just text and static images back then. In the late 90s and early 2000s, the internet was becoming mainstream. Lots of businesses and governments were going online and the first consumer services were appearing. We, got, we started sharing pictures and having our own websites. Google made search work extremely well and in the process, we scaled the business model of search. Lots of money was now being made online. From the mid-2000s to today, a lot has changed. Social media appeared and quickly became a massively adopted technology. Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube turned the publication model on its head, and we were all dumping enormous amounts of data, our own data, onto the internet. Foursquare told us where you were, whether others cared or not, and smartphones overtook PCs as the primary device for internet connectivity. So let's look at the same problems along uh, the trajectory that we just discussed. What, what were we dealing with back then? Well, at the start, the, uh, the problems were email viruses. Uh, they seemed so frustrating at the time, Little did we know what was around the corner, but we all started running antivirus software. In the late 90s, spam was becoming a huge problem, and we started seeing a different kind of attack. Worms. Virtual bullets fired at vulnerable systems that often resulted in compromise and data theft. And we saw the first large-scale distributed denial of service attacks. By then, intrusion detection, firewalls, and anti-spam systems were very common. In the current era, the attacks have become much more sophisticated and often targeted human fallibility. Phishing emails tried to trick you into coughing up passwords and other sensitive data. Rootkits took the malware problem literally to a new level, and the booming economic models of the internet driven by search and ad revenue led to an explosion of adware and spyware. Search engines became the most prevalent vector for malware infection. Typing free screensaver, don't do this, but typing free screensaver and clicking on a result is almost guaranteed to end your day badly. <laughs> Some smartphones are now rich targets for opportunistic malware writers. In this past March, Google had to pull 58 malicious apps from the Android market, but not before those apps were downloaded to around 260,000 devices. But perhaps the most concerning is the first extremely sophisticated targeted malware attack. It's called Stuxnet. It targeted the specific hardware used in the centrifuges found in an Iranian nuclear weapons facility. This may have been a noble attack, depending on your politics, but what happens when something like that is used on our power grid? It's pretty frightening. According to McAfee, there are now over 50 million unique pieces of malware floating around the internet, and 20 million of those appeared in the last year alone. It's growing very, very quickly. Now, because there's so much money to be made off you and I surfing the web and being an internet user, old world virus writers of the early 90s have largely been replaced. In their place now are startups equipped with business plans that monetize you by hijacking search results and controlling the ads you see. Others write spyware that steals your identity and poor control of your system. They make money either way, and it's a very frightening world. And because our technology makes, makes simple tasks, makes complex tasks very simple, we often don't know what's going on under the hood. We often leave tracks behind, our own little private version of WikiLeaks. Apple recently confirmed that the iPhone tracked the location of nearby network access points in a file that lives on your phone and is copied to your computer when you sync. Here's what I found on my phone when I looked at the data. So let's turn to WikiLeaks and its relevance to the issues of privacy on the internet. First, I should state that I think whistleblowers are a vital part of a functioning society. We need these brave people to stand up and disclose when our governments or businesses are acting illegally or unethically. However, I'm certainly not convinced that all the sensitive data being disclosed by WikiLeaks indicates wrongdoing. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has a very polarized view of government transparency, and that should be concerning to us. Transparency doesn't mean, in my opinion, that a government must, everything government does must be world visible. 